emergency? Uh, yeah, I have a dead body here. Harriet's laying in Ashton. What happened there? I don't know, but it looks very nasty. She, she, she's going, what I think. Do you live in this address or you visited this address? Uh, 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 it's my ex-wife. She's got a cord around her neck. Okay, all right, we're going to get police on their way and obviously we'll get ambulance as well to, to check. Um, She's cold. What's her name? Sharon. And her surname? Birchwood. When emergency services arrived at the rundown detached bungalow in Harriet's Lane in the afternoon of December 2007, they were greeted by a calm and relaxed man holding a cup of steaming coffee. Former husband from Epsom, Garam Birchwood, also known as George, told officers he first thought his vulnerable ex-wife was asleep when he discovered the fully clothed body tied up on the bed. Sharon was bound, gagged with tape, and strangled to death with an electric cord. Her body had been covered by piles of clothes, and she was still clutching a stamp from a Christmas card she had been sent by her mother. Sharon was a 52-year-old M.E. sufferer who lived by herself in her small Ashdead home. She had been married to George Birchwood. Some of her friends thought the couple were still married, though they had divorced in the early 90s. George had since remarried and had children with another woman, whilst also being good friends with his ex-wife Sharon. It seemed like Sharon was truly besotted with George and was happy to remain devoted to him in the hopes of rekindling their relationship. Detectives realised that due to her body being covered up with piles of clothing, it was almost impossible to determine the exact time of death, which was what the killer was hoping for. Therefore, the detectives needed to retrace Sharon's steps in order to find out when the murder may have occurred. Looking at the crime scene, police needed to figure out whether this was a pre-planned murder or a robbery gone wrong. However, looking at the house, it was hard to see if anything was stolen. Police also noticed there was no forced entry to any of the doors, which suggested that the person who killed Sharon could have been someone she knew and trusted. Searching carefully through Sharon's house, detectives concentrated on finding DNA, hoping it would lead them to a suspect. The tape used to tie Sharon was sent to the lab for testing, as well as other items. Police also managed to recover Sharon's diary, which became an important step in solving this murder. Sharon tended to write down her tasks for the day and tick them off when she has done them. The final task she ticked off was on the 4th of December, which was more than likely the day of the murder. On that day, she had gone to the farmer's market in Guildford. The last sighting they had of Sharon was of her getting off the train at Guildford Station, wearing the exact same clothes she was found deceased in. George Birchwood, Sharon's ex-husband, who discovered the body, was seen as a significant witness and was brought over to the police station for questioning. Tell me everything that you can about what you remember. I entered the property, no problems. I walked into her room and then, uh, and then discovered her in the bed. She was cold, very cold. So I just went straight out of the room and phoned 999. Okay, and waited for the, the ambulance people to arrive and then the police. You okay? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. And um, I don't think you need me to say anything after that. Perhaps now is the, the right time to sort of give me an understanding of the relationship you've, you you have with, with Sharon. How often you, you, were you visiting Sharon in recent weeks? Uh, four times a week. You were together for about 10 years and you separated about 87, 89. That's about right. Okay, and, and you got divorced sometime in the 90s? About mid 90s, I would okay. guess. It didn't ever end really, is the truth. We're best friends. Um, perhaps you can tell me more about her friends who visited. As far as actual friends are concerned, I think her sister is the one that she's closest to. Uh, and what's she called? Lauren. As the interview continues, the detectives grow more and more suspicious of George. 
Reading his body language throughout the hours of questioning, they noticed that whenever they spoke about general topics, George's body language would be very open and relaxed. There's no sign, I don't believe, as I didn't look, of it being frenzied, but it looks frenzied. Someone who's a bit disturbed. It was quite, I found it quite horrific. However, when they pushed on a hard subject, George would tense his face and cover it with his hand almost as if he was trying to remember his own lies. In order for the detectives to regard him as a potential suspect, they needed to establish a motive. Does she have any life insurance at all? Oh, yeah. Yes, she has. Yes, she's got life insurance okay. on that £62,000 mortgage. And do you know if you should have made a will? I believe there is a will in the house. Okay. But, of course, handwritten well, like that, I don't know how legal it is. And what does it say? Everything's left to me. Everything's left to you. And do you help me out financially where you're at at the moment? Financially, I'm... Are you in debt? Oh, yeah, I'm always in debt. Well, that's me. To the tune of what? In total? Maybe approaching 100 grand. The fact that he was debt-ridden and the sole beneficiary of his former wife's will meant that George had a lot to gain from her death. The detectives were now convinced that George Birchwood was behind this horrific murder. However, they had almost no proof to charge him with anything. They began by asking him about his whereabouts on Tuesday evening, which was believed to be the time the murder occurred. I just want you to, to talk me through and expand upon your movements. Um, I walked over the road wherever the lights were green could have been anywhere to get into the Ashley Centre. Just looking in windows just for Christmas, you know. And you drove straight home to your, to your mother's? Yeah. George has stated that at the time of the murder, he was at a shopping centre four miles away from Sharon's home. Police trawled through hours of CCTV footage from that evening to confirm if George was indeed telling the truth. Eventually, they found the evidence that George could not have killed his ex-wife. He had a rock-solid alibi. But, upon reviewing the shopping centre footage carefully, detectives began to suspect that something was off. It was approaching Christmas when most people would go inside different stores and buy gifts. However, George did not do any shopping. Police found it strange that he travelled several miles to stand in front of a few stores, wait a couple of minutes, and then immediately leave. It's almost as if he wanted to be seen. He knew it was a busy public place and would provide him with the alibi he needed. After a thorough search of his phone, police found a suspicious phone number that was called multiple times on the day of the murder. The detectives now believe that George may not have acted alone and therefore they needed to find out who he was in contact with around the time Sharon was murdered. Can we just clarify, first of all, your phone book? Who's on your phone book? You mean the contacts in this phone? Yes. 56049. Right, recently I've had two friends here from Thailand. Okay. Be one of those. So who are the friends from Thailand? One's called Paul. Paul, and what's his other name? I don't know. He's, he's actually a friend of a friend, really, isn't he? Yeah. And is he, is he Thai or is he English? He's English. Or he's English. And how long did he stay? Two weeks, ten days. And where, where did he stay? He stayed in London, he stayed with me, he stayed... Whereabouts would he stay with you? Well, my mother's. Drawn in by the police, George readily admitted that someone was staying with him around the time his wife was murdered a detail he failed to mention in hours of previous interviews. George claims he only knows Paul's first name. Police desperately wanted to find out more about this mysterious visitor. First, they scoured local CCTV and found footage of George's mother collecting an unknown man from the train station around that date George said Paul had arrived. Detectives knew his first name and now what Paul looked like, but they needed more details. 
George stated that Paul had been staying at his mother's house. Police were able to collect a DNA sample from a glass in the room where he'd stayed. Tests revealed that the man they were looking for was Paul Crine, a man who had been previously convicted of a bank robbery in the 1970s. Police found that Paul Crine's DNA perfectly matched the DNA that was found on the roll of tape that was used to bind Sharon with, along with his fingerprints, which were also found at the crime scene. Detectives now needed to find Paul Crine and put him into custody. So how would you contact him now if you had to contact him? Through someone else. Who's that? A uh, mate of mine in Thailand. Uh, Paul, this Paul's back in Thailand now. He's either in Thailand or Cambodia. Police knew that Paul Crine was the killer. However, they didn't believe that he was working alone. Paul did not know Sharon and had no motive to commit the murder. As they searched the house further, they also discovered some of Sharon's jottings on pieces of paper, which described her feelings and proved that she was already suspicious of her ex-husband prior to her murder. I'm just going to ask you your explanation of what some of these perhaps might mean. Yeah, Sharon's jottings would be very hard to answer, God. Are you hoping I'm going to die so that you can use my insurance to sort out your mess? She's not saying I was hoping. Say, am I? Throughout these jottings, there's a theme about getting rid of her. Well, I disagree with that. There's no theme about getting rid of her. Can you tell me what, what that is then? Well, I, I don't read it that way at all. I know Sharon. Did she say these things to you? She would write it. Then when I came in, she'd read it to me. But I did treat her accordingly. There's no doubt about it at all. The detectives believe that George has indeed arranged this murder and gave Paul Crine a monetary incentive. He was instantly made a suspect, and the decision was made to arrest him. There was a huge financial incentive for you to kill Sharon, and you enlisted the help of a known criminal. You were involved in Sharon's murder, even if you didn't yourself physically murder her. Is that the case? No. There's forensic evidence at the scene, George, which implicates Paul crime in Sharon's murder. His DNA profile has been found on the tape. So it's in or something like that. That he's used to bind Sharon. Have you got any comments to make about that? No. No idea how I got there. Sharon was murdered by strangulation and she had an extension cable wrapped around her neck. It's a very unusual method by which to kill somebody. Please, I don't wish to talk about it, okay? It is a very unusual method. Yes. It was very nasty and I was exceedingly upset about it. Yes. She didn't die immediately. I know that. I'm not stupid. That she suffered. Mm -hmm. And please, I don't really wish to call, talk about it anymore. Please can you keep it to questions that are necessary? I'll ask you some direct questions then, Yes, George. please. Did you kill Sharon? No. Did you witness Sharon being no. killed? Did you in any way assist in Sharon's no. murder? Wait, can you wait until I finish the question to your answer? Did you conspire in the killing of Sharon Birchwood? No. Do you know who murdered Sharon Birchwood? No. Did you have prior knowledge that Sharon was to be killed? No. Have you got anything else to say? Yes, yes. that's it's all nonsense. Everything I've just said is nonsense. Using Sharon's diary, police were able to make a timeline of the murder. Sharon left the house to go shopping in Guildford at around noon. At around 2.30pm, she was seen on camera coming back home. Paul Crine was waiting for her inside her house, as instructed by George Birchwood. Meanwhile, George Birchwood was shopping four miles away as the contract killer he had flown in from Thailand waited for his victim. When Sharon arrived at her residence, she walked up the lane into the back of the house. Paul was hiding in her bedroom as she hung her coat at the back of the door. She put her shopping to one side as she opened the Christmas card she received that same day from her mother. It was at that moment that detectives believe Paul struck her on the head, making her unconscious. He then laid her on the bed and bound her legs and arms with tape. He then strangled her using an electrical cable. After he was certain she was dead, he piled up clothing on top of her and then left the house. Police found CCTV footage from Heathrow Airport from the night of the murder. 
they see Paul Crine arrive at around 7pm. He walked around the airport the entire night as he waited for his early morning flight the following day. Paul Crine, originally from Manchester, was hired to carry out the murder for £30,000 by George Birchwood, who stood to gain £475,000 on his wife's death. They also planned to share the insurance payout between themselves. Although Paul Crine and George Birchwood pleaded not guilty, in 2009 they were both given life in prison with a minimum term of 32 years. Paul Crine died in prison on the 20th of January 2018. Graham Birchwood died in Wayland Prison in Norfolk on the 9th of September 2019.